Shando uh, Kurti, President of Court Information Management from Hungary. Welcome. And Anna Kanta, founder of Pledge Me New Zealand. And uh, just to give you an idea, we are going live on Facebook, um, and my account is also retweeting it. And the address is International Trade Center. I'm looking at it now. Um, it doesn't seem to be our session, but I'm sure something will be done to make sure that people are watching what we're talking about. Indeed, this is not going to be an academic discussion, right? We're talking about practices and people who are in the trade who have um, come up with great ideas and have tried everything they can to make that idea happen and work and bring it to the next level, to the region and to the international markets. So I think uh, uh, the stories we're going to hear are going to be interesting, relevant and possibly inspiring for millions of young people around the world who are uh, pursuing the same dream and maybe are having some difficulties here and there. So I hope our discussion will provide some inspirations to them. So we're going to have first um, the time for each one of you to tell your story and then maybe a short uh, Q&A with me if I have some questions and then we'll open it up uh, for a group discussion and then later on to the question and uh, answer session with the audience. So um, without much ado, um, shall we leave the, shall we open the floor with Mama? Yeah, you have about five minutes, but uh, feel free to, to talk. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Momar uh, Tal. I'm from Gambia. Gambia is a tiny country off the coast of West Africa, similar to Hungary. Uh, we have a very, very small uh, population of 1.8 million people, meaning we don't have much of a domestic market. So when I started my company, one of the main things was I was forced to become an exporter. I had to export only because I did not have a choice. Um, my company processes and exports uh, dried mangoes and peanuts, as you can see in the picture. Um, that's um, Musa, he's one of our um, employees. Uh, currently, export opportunities have given us the ability to provide jobs for over 200 people. 90% of them are women uh, in the Gambia. Um, as you can see, I'm fairly young. Don't let the lack of hair f fool you. But I'm, I'm only 30 years old. I've been in business uh, for about four years, and we've grown very rapidly thanks to um, the export opportunities that we've been able to, um, to take advantage of from Gambia. Uh, being a young exporter in West Africa, uh, we talk a lot about intra-Africa trade. Um, this is something that we pay a lot of lip service to. Um, and I think my role here is to explain what it means uh, in a practical sense. Uh, about a year ago, I took up the challenge of actually trading with uh, neighboring countries. Whereas earlier today, we heard that uh, Hungary takes advantage of its close proximity to Germany to do a lot of trade. For me, our Germany is Nigeria. Nigeria is the giant in ECOWAS. So um, this year, we started exporting um, dried mangoes to uh, to Nigeria to supply uh, uh, a brand in Nigeria. Nigeria, as we all know, is uh, the economic giant of West Africa. And uh, for a country of 1.8 million people, when you look at a country of 180 million people plus, it's an exciting opportunity. However, for us to ex it's easier for us to export um, our produce to China and Europe than it actually is for me to export to Nigeria, which is a four-hour flight from Gambia. Why is this? Um, there's many barriers that we face, um, including infrastructure uh, issues, um, customs barriers, and ineffic different inefficiencies that just make it a headache to reach these um, closer markets. Also, the infrastructure that we have in terms of the ports and the seaports are geared towards exporting to the European markets and the Asian markets because most of the lines are dedicated to those markets. So when we talk about intra-Africa trade, what are we doing? What are the governments doing? What policies are in place to encourage people like me to invest more in um, trading with Nigeria? invest more in trading with the likes of Kenya, South Africa, Rwanda, when we don't have the infrastructure to do that. But if I want to send uh, my produce to China, it's, it's very easy. Um, another thing is the certification and uh, quality standards. Uh, 
for us, um, entering the European market was a huge challenge, uh, mainly because of the uh, certifications needed to get food into the EU. Uh, this is something that we've been working on for the last few years and um, we're still working on now. Uh, this is something that young entrepreneurs and a lot of um, export-oriented businesses, especially in the food industry, need to pay a lot of attention to. Uh, getting certification like HACCP um, certification or organic certification is extremely expensive and not accessible for the average African business. So when we talk about um, reducing barriers to trade, we talk about policies and we talk about all these things, but a lot of the certifications that you require to access these markets are barriers for young entrepreneurs like myself. If, if, if a consultant to get you a HACCP certification costs you $30,000, let's be honest, how many entrepreneurs in Africa can afford that? Um, so we, we're optimistic. Uh, we see a lot of goodwill. We see a lot of uh, opportunities like this where we come to tell our stories and we always get the same thing that um, governments want to do for us. They want to open doors for us. They want to open markets for us. But when we do enter and we actually do the work, we realize that um, a lot of the time the goodwill is there, but in practicality the action is not being felt by the young businesses. And um, I think that's something that we should really take. If there's anything that I leave here with is that um, I would like more proactive involvement from policymakers to make a lot of these challenges a thing of the past. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's really fascinating to hear you talk about that, uh, the fact that you were able to, global, uh, to go global, not because you wanted to, but almost because you didn't have any other choice. But again, uh, there must have been challenges to, to do even that. Um, if you were to give one piece of advice to the people listening on the internet who also want to go global, uh, what is that one advice or one recipe that helped you successfully embark on, on that journey? Um, you have to be, you have to go the extra mile and be innovative in your solutions. Um, example? So for us, for example, um, whereas in Hungary, uh, you might have 24 hours electricity. Um, in my country, electricity is a luxury when you do have it. And um, as a manufacturer, this was a major challenge. So. Uh, we had to come up with a solution where we would use, as you can see, we have um, peanuts that we export and the waste byproduct from that is the waste peanut shell. And we had to come up with a way to use that waste peanut shell to create the energy so we can power our mango drying factory. So we had to be innovative because we didn't have a choice. We would not be profitable if we used diesel generators to run our mango machines. So we had to use um, biofuel. Um, mainly because we're forced to be innovative. So I, my advice is that you're going to meet a lot of challenges, but your success is going to be determined by the little things that you do, the little innovations that you make to make yourself competitive. Yeah. yeah. Well, the impression I got really is uh, you're not looking at the challenges as challenges, but as in incentives, right, to excel, to do, to... Yeah. Uh, and opportunities. And opportunities. That's a great, uh, great uh, piece of advice. Uh, we're going to have a more opportunity to talk to, to, talk to Mama later on, but uh, let's move on to um, Lorana. Yeah, uh, she is CEO and co-founder of Believe Brazil. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard about this company, but it's really quite interesting because it is uh, the world's largest network of time exchange. I would love to have that. I'm always running out of time. So let me know how it works and uh, I might use it first place. Now, she uh, was also, she's also a, a World Economic Forum Global Shaper. In 2014, the MIT Technology Review elected her one of the 10 most innovative Brazilians under 35 years old. Um, she was also elected by BBC Global, uh, one of the 100 most inspiring women of 2015. So indeed, uh, a very, very high honor for a very young age. Um, tell us a bit about where, does the, where the idea came from and how you realized it. Great. I used to say that um, Liv's idea came from 
an open web because when I was 18, my addiction was documentaries. So I was watching everything that was possible uh, online, even like uh, documentaries about trading on Africa, water crisis in Greece, uh, everything. And this was amazing because it gave me some windows that I think tailored uh, Believe's idea. And I see two documentaries uh, as very important looking back. The first one was about uh, alternative currencies and how our relationship with money could be more healthy than it is today. Because a lot of times we have a lot of resources that we are not using just because we don't have money to do or to trade them. Let's imagine, for example, that Anna has an English lesson that I would love to, to assess. And I have a bike that is in my apartment and Anna would love to have for the weekend to go out with friends. But the problem is that I don't have money and Anna don't have money too. So what we think, oh my God, scarcity, crisis, we don't have money. But in fact, she still has the knowledge in English and my bike is still at the apartment doing nothing. So when you create alternative currencies, you can bring the concept of abundance and allow people to trade resources that were being wasted just because of a virtual scarcity concept. So the documentary speaks about that and how um, initiatives like time banks that they exist since the 80s, um, very small communities, uh, NGO based where we connect talents and skills of people, how they can provide alternative ways for, for trading and, and exchange of resources. And the second documentary was about online collaboration and how internet is empowering people to live new experiences and share just because uh, we are connecting people based on values. One very uh, interesting example was a football team in the UK that the owners of the team, they, were, um, they decided to close the, the team. Uh, but then 16,000 um, 60, owners, at people who cheers for the team, they decided to organize and buy the team together, so to save it. And every time that the players go to the field, uh, they vote for who are the players who will be playing. So probably 30 years ago, there's a lot of football teams that lost um, the importance. But because internet's available today, people are able to organize. Yeah, so that's how the idea came about. But how did you materialize it, okay, make, make so it into a business, an international one? <laughs> Thank you. So I believe it's, it's uh, both, um, both ideas together because it's a collaborative platform. Uh, they use time as a currency and in a very simple way. So you can offer, for example, one hour of Spanish lessons for it, you receive one hour time credit, and then you can exchange this credit for any activity available in the platform, like financial tips, Photoshop tutorials, someone to fix your computer. And the idea is that everyone has a talent, a skill, or a knowledge that should be shared, and we use this as a resource to promote abundance and provide equal opportunities among people. Uh, once 24 hours is a resource that every human being has equally every day. So that's a way to promote equality uh, in this field. And to be an international business uh, on an innovative field like that, it was always a challenge. But since the beginning of Believe, my idea came as a global idea. So uh, even though I was in Brazil during university with no money, started believing that this could be a global opportunity. So I started financing through the money from my prom in university. I asked for my mom and dad, uh, okay, I don't need to have a prom. You can give me the money and I'll pay the developers. So that was the deal. Um, I got a little bit with that and with an internship in the public ministry. Um, this was how we launched an MVP, got validation from users, a, li a little um, media coverage and growth. And then we applied for a UK government uh, grant for startups. And that was when we became uh, the first step to become a global company, being accelerated by the UK government in 2014. So that was the beginning. How many people are working for your company now? Uh, today we are eight people and we have 150,000 users from all around the world. Wow. So indeed, uh, for the shared economy, for the shared economy community, any idea is a global idea, right? There is no border on the internet. But again, it must also come with challenges. What is the biggest challenge for you 
and how did you overcome that? Two minutes, please. <laughs> okay, <laughs> really fast. So I think one of the main challenges mostly for global impact business is how to find a scalable business model in the beginning. Because uh, even in Brazil, like the investment ecosystem is not that friendly for business that are, they don't have a clear business model in the beginning. So what I, t uh, what I think is very important for entrepreneurs is to understand uh, how you can validate and get a little bit of, of attraction on the business side too. Because of course in Silicon Valley, you can get an idea and just say like, okay, we can make money just in three or four years. Now we just need money to, to invest. Uh, in my country or other countries, even in the UK, you need to prove your idea this way. And so the challenge and the way that I, I overcome this was partnershiping with big companies and doing some innovative projects uh, with companies like Unilever or Teva so we could uh, work without investment in the beginning. Well, we'll hear more from you later on yeah. as well. Uh, let me introduce our next uh, speaker. He is uh, Mr. Shandor Kurti. He is president of Court Information Management from Hungary. And he has been president of uh, Court Information Security and Data Recovery Company since 1998. Now, this company has developed a hard disk repair technology, a world-renowned data recovery technology, as well as IT security technology and uh, um, methodology. Now, he has received many awards as well, and he was um, awarded the Ernst and Young Entrepreneur of the Year in 2003 as a worldwide uh, competition and in 2006 he also served as a member of the jury for the same competition. So uh, Shandor, please tell us how you started it, right? You started in a very different era, uh, almost immediate at the beginning of uh, 1989 at a different era um, in a different business as well. Please go ahead. Thank you so much to uh, invited me to here. And again, I will tell you that my company name is Kurt, as similar as my family name. Uh, but uh, uh, everybody is uh, good to know in case if they lose the data, valuable data, so how to run to recover that one. It's happened that it's uh, in my family that my brother is a real innovator and about 30 years ago he had a patented uh, process that is how to repair the hard, uh, hard drive, repair the computer memory and uh, on base of that we started our company uh, two years later but that was the first time in my life when in Hungary and on Eastern Europe we could be uh, established a private uh, uh, legal companies and that was the reason so only that one and in the last uh, 28 or something years uh, we do the best uh, on this business that uh, at the very beginning the Hungary got help from the Canadian state. They sent to us professional managers, free of charge, and we got one of them. And uh, after that, that he realized that there are about uh, a dozen uh, employees in my company, and we had a similar number of uh, uh, <coughs> technique what we advertised as we are fantastic on the top level on that he uh, advised so please don't do that you lies you lie it's not true it's impossible that it's the 12 people and 12 professional uh, it's all all together is not okay because we spoke about yeah we could be repaired the computers we it's uh, have a network building technology and of course the data recovery and uh, the system integration and so on and so on and he advised please say only one and i not understand what he says uh, and i wanted to oh it was a 
bad uh, situation because really it's a bad situation was at that time regarding the business in Hungary and we need everything so somebody come in and customer need for us and lot of uh, job we uh, advertised. Anyway, he went home, we again speak about our 12 or more uh, values for what we could sell. A year later, when he came back, he said he was in a, a half of my size and double. The, and he said, and uh, so I don't believe that the Canadian state spend so stupid company a huge money. And that time I really uh, understand, so we lost one year because he at years ago wanted to tell us you have only one target, one issue, that is to build a brand. And we realized that, and up to now, we think so, so we got from this Canadian million and million dollar euros, foreigns, doesn't matter what, but only for that, so build a real brand. And uh, on base of our uh, ID, we extremely quickly, on this ID, extremely quickly went on the international market. We went to the number one IT show that is in Sebit in Germany, in Hanover, and with a special boot, with a special dance. Thank you for the Brazils, because we it's a, somebody do that. And really, we do everything on that, so we became a well known. And over two years on the Sebit show, we got the VIP. Uh, Ex, uh, um, uh, exhibitors and on this way uh, we got a, a network in Europe, a European data recovery service so that the center in Budapest and we did the best one Papa, I say that is uh, not more time I have anyway um, I wanted to say that one that is my brother and uh, a million uh, dollar asset <laughs> and uh, dollar. May I, I really wanted to extremely quickly tell that story so please believe that so not everything in my mind that is uh, we got a call from the business week that they need a data recovery and my call center is my colleague uh, she said okay we can do it at that time we did it on three thousand dollar and three weeks and for the business week she said okay two days and two thousand hungarian foreigns no dollars and that was that uh, we catch the business week and for that is we answered because it was a free of charge basically and that was the reason why we uh, appeared on the page that putting Hungarian high touch on the map and the Hungary has an extremely big uh, deficit from uh, brand extremely big deficit yeah. from okay. yeah Shandor, Shandor, sorry to to interrupt you I see um, um, it's a very specialized area and it really takes a lot of knowledge specialized knowledge to be able to do what you have accomplished however on the management side right I think it is extremely important for you uh, coming from a technical background to also be, a, be able to manage the people manage the finance manage the company and corporate social responsibility yeah. all of that where do you get your knowledge from that regard uh, uh, that's the management that is the real barrier of us if uh, Momo is said about his barrier at home and I have really that is the management so uh, the culture of uh, the East European technical culture I mean uh, that is uh, so deep so low level and we really, it's all of our staff, or basically the major number of our staff, staff is worked abroad, came back to home, and they realized, so what is the level of the service, how to serve the persons, what it's need to catch the real customer, 
and to serve them, and that is the number one question. And so up to now, we are about 110 or something like that number. But that is not because we have no enough, the market is small, no. Because the word market is quite big for us, but we could not understand, realize how to serve the uh, people abroad. That is our number is, one question problem. Yeah, still, still the number one question I see. So the challenges uh, stay, right? And the challenges change um, throughout the time. Um, another picture, uh, a highly recommended small company. I see that's by that's the European uh, Year of uh, Volunteering 2011, awarded to to your company. Anyway, uh, we probably will hear more about your story uh, in just a moment. But uh, let's move on to Anna. She is founder of Pledge Me uh, New Zealand. Now, this is New Zealand's first crowdsourcing crowdfunding platform since it was launched five years ago over 1100 creative community and entrepreneurial projects have met their goals and over 15 million US dollars have been pledged through her website uh, and I also created the unconference known as um, women who get shit done in June 2016 I broke a record by swearing on air uh, where a diverse group of women entrepreneurs can share, learn, laugh, and build a network with which um, to change the world. She previously worked for the New Zealand government, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Harvard, and completed her master's in entrepreneurship with a focus on crowdfunding. So, Anna, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my journey coming to where I am today. And this is a picture of where it started. Um, I'm not that different to many of you. I used to work for the government in New Zealand, specifically in economic development. But at the ripe old age of 25, I'd realized I'd peaked with what I could do working in the government without having any private sector experience. So at that point in time, I decided that I either had to go and get a job with a company and learn there, or go back and do my master's. And in a slightly crazy move, I decided to keep my job, go and do a master's, and start my company as my master's thesis. I didn't sleep for about a year, um, but this is what we created. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see the first iteration of our company. That's not actually the computer it was built on, but I thought it made a statement about how old and bad it looks. Um, and on the right, you can see what we have today. Um, I know many of you probably already know this, but when you're starting something new, you just have to get started. Um, you're probably going to be embarrassed by the first thing that you create. You should be, because you shouldn't be waiting so long that it's perfect. Um, and over time, you'll iterate, and you shouldn't be so in love with the solution that you created that you can't change. You actually have to love the problem that you're solving. So the problem that we're solving is funding. So who is getting funded and who's funding? And the way that we s decided to solve that was with crowdfunding. Um, do you know what crowdfunding is? Any nods in the room? It really is as simple as it sounds. You go out to your crowd for funding. Um, you set a goal of how much money you want to raise, a deadline in which you want to raise it by, and you offer something in return. Um, this isn't cyber begging. You're not asking for donations. You're actually offering something in return. There's a value exchange. Um, so for project-based crowdfunding, you offer rewards, maybe the thing that you're creating. Um, for equity crowdfunding, you offer shares in your company, so you're selling ownership. And for crowd lending, you're actually borrowing money from your crowd and repaying it over time. Um, as said, we've had over 1,200 campaigns through our platform and almost $17 million pledged. And it's everything that you can think of and not think of. Everything from a, a woman who started a refugee-focused catering company in Wellington. Um, the rewards that they offered during their campaign were baklava. Um, because they wanted to celebrate the foods that these women made. And they raised $20,000 to start their company. Um, through to Eat My Lunch, which is a buy one, gift one model. If you buy a lunch from them, they gift a lunch to a child in need. Because sadly, in New Zealand, 30% of our children live in poverty. And they borrowed money th from their crowd by issuing out lunch bonds. So they were borrowing money and repaying it over time, either at a 6% interest rate or a 0% interest rate, with that money going back into feeding children. Um, we decided recently to export. Previously, we'd supported companies that were exporting but didn't actually export ourselves. Um, so we decided to move to Australia. I've been there for three weeks. Um, and we decided to do that because we were the first 
in New Zealand to be licensed to provide equity crowdfunding. New Zealand was actually the first country in the world to change their legislation to allow equity crowdfunding. And we thought that experience was something that was exportable. And so when the legislation changed three weeks ago in Australia, I got on a plane to go and try to make that happen. Um, just some tips if you are starting your own, own company or thinking about crowdfunding, you have to be really clear on your why. Why are you doing what you do? Our why is to help Kiwis fund the things they care about. Brienne's why, who is a woman who crowdfunded through us and issued out sh shares to her crowd, was to reduce waste. So her company is a solid hair care business. She creates shampoo in bars. And she does that because she doesn't think it makes sense to have a plastic bottle filled with water and go into a room filled with water. Um, she's already stopped 200,000 bottles from going to landfill. And she raised $200,000 in two weeks from her crowd when she decided to raise investment. 80% of those investors were current customers who loved what she did, and three of them were chemists. So when she moved from her home kitchen to a factory, one of those chemists helped her um, figure out how to double her batching. Um, the cool thing with her is she actually just raised her second round of investment, so she has m even more shareholders now. And she had 1,200 customers sign up to invest. Only 250 got in before her round closed. She raised half a million dollars in 90 minutes. Um, and the final tip is if you're thinking about, do I have enough time? A little bit more. Oh, I've got 30 seconds. I, I'm <laughs> timing. Um, and, the, and the other thing to think about is if, you're, if you're building a company or thinking about crowdfunding is to build your crowd. I mean, you already have a crowd because you're in this world. There are people around you that probably love what you do. Um, but actually create connections everywhere that you can. Um, when Stu from Yeasty Boys, a local craft brewery in New Zealand, decided he wanted to export to the UK, he went out to his crowd to raise the money to do that. Um, so he was already sending um, crates of beer over to the UK, but he actually wanted to set up over there. And he was really funny. He told me that he needed five weeks to raise his money because he was going overseas and he didn't think he'd have enough time. That night when he launched his campaign, he raised half a million dollars in half an hour. And I've never seen someone more terrified than Stu when he realized he hadn't organized a babysitter and his wife wasn't there. And he had to call and apologize profusely. Um, but he had everyone from his next door neighbor invest in his company through to his distributors in Hong Kong. Thank you. Wow, but uh, uh, you still have, yeah, I see people already applauding. Um, what is the challenge for you doing this uh, crowdfunding business in, in a very high developed uh, environment, highly regulated? Uh, what is the biggest thing you have to worry about? going to jail. Uh, <laughs> Why? I, I, I'm not sure if anyone here is regulated. Um, we are unfortunately regulated uh, almost three ways. We're applying for our Australian license at the moment. And the thing that keeps me awake at night is money laundering and terrorism and all of the things that we have to comply with to actually maintain our license. Um, it's a, a terrifying to be regulated so many ways. Yeah, but what do you, how did you cope with it? Uh, I have lots of friends and wine <laughs> and lawyers, <laughs> lots of lawyers. Yeah, but actually to study the environment meticulously and navigate. Definitely a lot of relationships that we have uh, both within government and outside of government, mm -hmm. lawyers, accountants, everything that you need. Um, also, unfortunately, we need money for that. Regulation doesn't come cheap, which is the annoying bit. If any of you are writing laws, try to make them simple. You shouldn't have like 20 different guides to help someone figure out what's happening in your legislation. Um, the people that pro are profiting from this shouldn't be the lawyers. It should be the people that are, you're helping. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things that kept you awake at night um, wouldn't be, wouldn't want to be in your position though. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, fascinating stories, but just to start, I'm sure, uh, just a few tips that you can share for the moment um, out of the thousands of hours, tens of thousands of hours that you've already put into your work. Uh, again, I know it is um, quite simplistic sometimes to try to give people advice in a very short period of time. Uh, I would still like to open the floor and ask each one of you maybe one common question is, uh, for anyone who, who wants to start a business and bring it global, uh, what is the, the thing to avoid in your particular circumstances, you know, or the mistake that you made, so you, you would say, okay, I'm not going to do that again. Uh, Moma. Um, see, that's a tough question because there's so many things that you need to avoid, but um, just the, off the top <laughs> of my head, 
um, don't overpromise and underperform. I like to underpromise and overperform because I'm um, funny story when I first started my company I knew nothing about the food industry I knew nothing about the peanuts and I, I met a guy who said hey I'm looking for um, peanuts in Gambia and I said yeah I can deliver and he said yes I need 3,000 tons I'm like yes I can do it and um, uh, long story short uh, I was in the middle of a r very very remote village um, in Gambia with no electricity no roads or anything um, looking at a pile of peanuts um, that all the farmers in the neighborhood that I had called and promised them I'd buy had just piled up and expected me to pay for. I didn't know who owned what. I didn't know how much it weighed. I didn't know. Um, I didn't know how to even bag it and get it to the city. And um, they were ready to riot because they just wanted their money. So uh, I had overpromised. Um, I didn't organize myself. I didn't organize the farmers. And uh, eventually, I had to buy all of it and even though half of it was crap and um, I ended up losing everything I had at that point so uh, if I could go back and tell myself to be patient and not promise anything and um, take your time learn go through the steps um, but it was a hard lesson that I had to uh, learn um, and luckily now I'm okay yeah. did you get any, get any support later on that you're not uh, making the same mistakes yep. or advice from from agencies yes so once we'd already proved concept and we'd already proved that we were successful um, a few agencies w came on board to help accelerate our um, construction of our uh, new factory um, where the World Bank uh, supported and uh, so did um, I'm not sure if anyone is aware of the Tony Elamelu Foundation um, based in Nigeria also supported our project and um, without them they wouldn't have accelerated to where we are today so it's very important to also have those sort of um, developmental development minded uh, support systems for young business people in Africa mm -hmm. Lorana your story I think in my opinion one of the important um, mistakes that we do as an entrepreneur is because we want our idea to come out uh, very fast and sometimes we we lack in finding the right people to be partners with um, in Brazil recently uh, there's a research on the most uh, biggest uh, cause of failure in companies and everyone there is like uh, saying okay we don't have much funding so funding is a problem and then what come up was like problem with uh, partners so this is the first reason for uh, companies to break uh, in Brazil so I think uh, choosing wisely your partners based on values and that's why I agree I agree with Anna that it's very important to know your why and your motivation and why you are doing that and fight people not equal you it's good to have diversity and someone with different opinions but the same values people that value the same thing and these sometimes take time to discover so if they are there for the money or for the social change or to be famous discover these and then find the right people because they are in the end the ones who will make it uh, successful or not so I would advise to just take a little bit care on this part of finding partners mm -hmm. uh, are you talking about partners business part or are you also talking business about business partners Okay, what about the, the, the human resources aspect? Um, um, what, any specific uh, requirement you have over there? And, uh, I think a uh, uh, startup uh, very important quote is like hire slow, fire fast. So I think this is it's, uh, true because sometimes we, we need to build res this relationship with any person that enters the company. And as I said, startups want things fast because we are all about timing and getting your product out. But understanding the time of meeting people and, and having very clear about your values is very important. As a social business, we, we have very clear that social impact is the main issue. But even though this is something cool to say, who are the ones who really want to sacrifice sometimes to just make it happen in the beginning. So I think this is very, very important in any field. Shandor? Mm -hmm. uh, in our business, the number one uh, question is the trust. So similar as a bank, so it's, uh, uh, we could be give back the data and your valuable data will uh, save all that 
nobody will know about it. So it's all business. It's uh, the number one, really, it's uh, that is the trust. And in this case, on the level of the politics, it's appeared that because, for example, for us, the real market, world market, is that countries where the Hungary has a good connections. So it's, uh, I could say, some uh, countries where we are extremely freely could be work because they like us as a Hungary, as a country, as in Vietnam, in Egypt, in the Far East, uh, basically we have in China, it's a real project uh, and work on that and a huge size of which as for us, not for China. And uh, extremely, uh, we work on that so it's uh, to move to the uh, uh, north west side of Europe we have in Jews, for only for this reason we have a German subsidiaries. So no other reason, only because it's a dot uh, HD, that it means that it's, you are a German and it's be, we believe that as you are a real extra German. And no other reason we have, because it's uh, to uh, this all subsidiary is in Bochum, uh, extremely far, a uh, bad weather, uh, what's, it's a fan, uh, not to be there, mm -hmm. but for the business, it's uh, extremely good for us, and yeah. we do it. Yeah, well, that's kind of a, a reality, right? The reality in this world that people sometimes just look at what is coming after that dot, if it, <laughs> um, and then they, 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 you know, put their, their level of trust uh, according to that, but still, um, what is the mistake that you want that you would warn people to avoid in, in, a, in a similar business that you're doing? No, it's, uh, it's impossible that it's uh, in that case it's all the business line is will kill in that if somebody failed or some problem appear on that so it's uh, that is uh, and the last 28 years it's not happened yet but it's every day it could be happened. It's some did a, do a mistake or speak about that, what is impossible to do it. So it's extremely sensitive, this business, what we are doing. Yeah, always uh, treading on the line, I can imagine. Uh, Anna, finally, yeah? I think the biggest mistake is to think it's gonna be easy or quick. Um, I think that what we're doing by nature is challenging existing um, systems and, and just building things that haven't been built. So you can't always compare yourselves to other people that you think are successful or compare your business to other businesses. Um, one of the best bits of advice that I ever got was from another entrepreneur who actually sold his company very well in New Zealand. And he said, you can't compare your insides to other people's outsides. So what you're feeling and what you're going through, you can't compare it to what other people look like in the world because they're actually probably feeling it as well. But if you have one sentence you want to say to, to the policymakers in the respective region, what would be, you know, um, I'm sure the environment uh, is, is challenging in different yeah. ways, Anna. It's, it's right, not, simple rules? Yeah, yeah, it's not easy for us, and maybe in some ways it shouldn't be, but you can make it easier as regulators and as governments. There are ways to make this simpler, um, so one of our challenges doesn't have to be dealing with you. Yeah, Shandor? Anyway, for us in the homeland is the Europe and European Union, and uh, we work on that to be well known here and not only in Vietnam and Mongolia. And uh, that is our target in the next few years of that. For the policymakers here, uh, any uh, wish? Uh, it's a, no, no, it's a far. Uh, you mean that is uh, so it's. Uh, Your uh, wish, you know, something about the environment that you can change mm -hmm. in the business uh, environment. Uh, that is, uh, our business environment, it's uh, extremely, uh, as I told it before, that is uh, extremely low here in this country. And we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, problems and we had a lot of action, what we have to do. And for example, and in my presentation was, but that is a picture that 
So is the Kurd is focused on the education, on the gypsy, on the disadvantaged gypsy education. That is our target and that is again for that. So how to grow the culture of our nation and we could work on that. Of course, it's uh, not uh, a large money of that, but we, we have some ID, we have some technology, yeah. and we have some, it's a unique software of that, how to teach them online interactive methodology and the language learning. It is an international story. It's uh, nobody wanted to kill that kind of action, and that's what we do it. I see, but very, very important point I think you're making there. Lorana. Um, in my opinion, I have maybe two, two recommendations for the legislators. I think the first one, it's for sure to collaborate um, from collaborative economy, but also as startups and design thinkers. We, we know that it's very important uh, to put other people's shoes and walk a little bit on, on our side. So I think to collaborate, bring uh, entrepreneurs to the table and ask and talk and just like, uh, let's learn together because I'm, I'm graduated in law. I studied human rights for a few years and I know on the, our side we want also legislators, they want to do good and provide everything that society needs to cover the rights. But having this collaboration and this talk is very important. So this will be my first recommendation. And the second one that I'm also very passionate about is just like, let's award impact business. Like business that impact the world and care about um, what we are doing as a society, as as something that is really the, not making profit just, but really leaving a country or a world that other people will live in the next generations. A legacy. A legacy. Yeah. Business that care for that and care for people and they consider themselves social impact business, they should receive uh, some, some help, you know, even in taxes or legislation. I don't know how, but there's a lot of opportunities for helping impact business and transforming the mindset of old business that they can be an impact business too and they are the ones who will survive. So how we can help and, and help business that are traditional become impactful. So I think this is very important. Mm -hmm. Mama. Um, I'm going to send my message basically to the um, policy makers for the least developed countries where I'm from. Um, focus on creating the enabling environment for young entrepreneurs to thrive. Um, often we go to a lot of conferences and we say a lot of good things, but on the ground when you speak to the young entrepreneur, nothing has changed. So we need more implementation, we need more action and less rhetoric. Um, that's what is most important for us. Uh, yeah, just do, just get to work. Provide the electricity. <laughs> exactly, I need electricity, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, um, thank you very much. Um, we still have some time, I think. Um, why don't we open the floor to see if uh, anybody have any questions or any comments from what we have heard so far. Yeah, I see a gentleman here. Uh, could we have the microphone sent over to this gentleman here? Yeah, on the, on the table, on the second row. Please raise your hand again. Yeah, so that uh, our staff can see you. And please tell us where you're from and... Uh, okay, my name uh, is Hani Sambul. Um, from the International Trade Finance Corporation. Uh, my question is regarding the uh, crowdfunding. Um, as you know, the, the normal traditional way of, uh, of uh, mobilizing resources for trade finance is, is through the normal traditional you know, network of banks and, and organizations. Uh, do, you, do you think the crowdfunding can, uh, can be another innovative way of uh, of really um, bringing also funds for short-term financing? Definitely. I think that crowdfunding is a way to democratize funding. So it's not just the same people getting funding from the banks, it's people that maybe would be outside the bank's um, realm or not their risk appetite. 
Um, we have a campaign at the moment in Christchurch. They're an urban farm, and they're borrowing money from their crowd. And they've got three different repayment terms. The first is they'll pay your cash back fully in a 5% interest rate. The second is they'll pay your cash back half and half in produce and then a 10% interest rate. And the third is they'll repay fully in produce. They've called this the broccoli bonds. And that's a different way of going out to your crowd and actually having your interest going to the people that are interested in what you're doing rather than back to the bank, back into your community. So I think there is a possibility there. You just need to make sure that you're not putting um, those entrepreneurs or founders in a situation where they couldn't repay. Um, so you need to assess that they have the ability. Yeah. Okay, yes, this gentleman here, another question. Peter Raymond, full of in the speech. What do you think about your company in the next 20 years? In the next 20 years? years for example. Yeah, for all of them? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Moma, do you think about that? Uh, yes, all the time. Um, uh, in where I'm from, most uh, companies die after the founder dies. And um, for us, we're definitely looking at creating an institution in our country that not only lifts farmers out of uh, poverty, but creates a sustainable value chain where um, when you come to Gambia 20 years from now, there is a thriving mango business, there's a thriving um, groundnut business, there's a thriving econo economics, economic sector around um, agricultural produce with Tropingo Foods in the center of that. And um, long after I retire, at, 20 years, I hope I'm retired by then. Uh, I want this co company to continue to provide opportunities for other people and inspire people to set up similar companies. Lorena? Um, from, from my side, I think uh, in the 20 years, if, even with the fourth industrial revolution and all this uh, displacement and unemployment in some fields, it's very important to understand that people are trying to uh, have new ways of exchanging and, and building capacity. Uh, by 2020, 40% uh, of the American, U uh, the American for workforce will be freelancers and, and independent workers. So how you can use the time, spare time of these people to make it valuable and a tradable way. So I think being addressing these with disruptive technologies like blockchain and other new New, new ways of creating currency is something that Believe is looking for. But most importantly, most importantly for me, because right now, like hipsters and people who love sharing economy, they are using that. But my work in the last year and now working with uh, big companies uh, who care about social impact is to bring this to the percentage of people that don't have access to money. So how we can do and use technology to really bank the unbankable using time as currency. Wow, there's a huge potential to be tapped there. Yeah, I'm Shandana. not afraid from the next uh, 20 or something like uh, years because the manufacturers of the memory manufacturers, uh, they have a quite a clear plans for that. And uh, our job is the same, as, uh, similar as it was in the last 25 or 27 years, only need to follow them understand what is the technology and it seems that it's, we are on that way in the last years and it will be the similar years and only the market will much, much, much bigger than it, it is today. Anna? Uh, in 20 years time, um, I hope I'll have had a holiday by then. Um, but I also, I hope that crowdfunding is a core part of the financial markets, that it is one way to get funded, not the only way. I think there's still room for banks um, in different ways, but I think that it, it hopefully by then will be one of the core tools that entrepreneurs can use to fund um, the things that they care about. Um, I also hope that by that point, um, we'll have redefined enterprise to just be social. So there won't be a term social enterprise where companies are doing good and doing well, but actually all companies will be social. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? Yes, Ms. Ambassador, please. They're, they're on the front row, yeah. No, first of all, I'd like to thank the panelists. We've had very interesting examples over a range 
of um, different activities. Um, these are success stories. But for every one of them, I could tell you there were a long number of failures in the given areas. So how do we, for these success stories, how do we make sure that they are shared? How what do you identify as some of the factors that made you succeed and others failed in your same field? And how do we share these experiences to make sure that a lot more benefit from it? Specifically, I, was, I wanted to add a question for the recovery, and that must be something which is very much needed in all parts of the world. Because for some of our countries, we know that once you lose the data, that's it. So that how do we spread that sort of business to our parts of the world and for the crowdfunding i just wanted to ask how do you get confidence for people to give money because it's not like the banks they ask you for collaterals but these are just people who are giving money and how do you make sure that you have enough confidence that money could be paid to crowdsourcing thank you thank you shandor first question for you so, uh, I, I think uh, about that, so that's the success story is uh, that it's the need to believe every day, every time, and we have enough success story for that, so uh, like that, and to do the next one. I wanted to tell you a lot of details, but it's no time, really time, but uh, every biggest uh, newspapers appeared about uh, at least once that uh, this a small Hungarian company is did that one, that one, that one. It was in not only the Business Week but in the Financial Times, in the Wall Street Journal about uh, two weeks ago about the number one European Union paper that is the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. It was it's an uh, extremely good uh, 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 text about us and saying a, a lot of good news about Hungary regarding us and not regarding our other side. So uh, we uh, used that. We are really like it and we do the, everything. So it's, uh, for example, to appear in the US market with a picture when Mr. Bush uh, president take a handshake with me, oh, it's not a bad situation. So for us, basically in the US, every IT uh, door is open for the start in that case. And we work on that. And that is, for example, that is the same reason so why I'm sitting here, because I was invited and I like so much uh, to show that, so yes, exists a small Hungarian company who is absolutely professional for the problem, in that case that you have a problem with your IT technology, yeah. and then not how to prevent that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think that is why forums like this is extremely helpful uh, to provide the stage for SMEs who need to get their story out. Anna? Uh, so the question was, with crowdfunding, how do we validate the campaign before it goes live? How you, know, you make people trust you to trusted. give money. Yeah. yeah, so I think the thing is it comes down to the campaign creator, so the person that puts that campaign up into the world. It's their crowd first that they activate. And if their crowd believes that they'll be able to repay or believes that they'll send out their rewards, it ripples out from there. Um, the World Bank did a report in 2012 that showed fraud and crowdfunding is very low because of these constellations of trust. So the first people that get on board are really your own crowd. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a question. Thank from, you. Yeah. I have a question that I've been asked uh, to relay from Geneva because we have the ITC staff who are watching all of you on live stream. And the question is from Momar. Uh, they would like to know, does he have a background in business or did he just pave his own way? Was it education? How did you get there? Um, I have zero background in business. Um, I actually studied um, international development and economics in uh, university. Um, but like most uh, entrepreneurs, uh, somewhere along the journey, I started a business while I was in university and I decided to drop out of school and follow business full-time. And um, my education in business uh, 
happened on the job that day when I was in the village looking at a pile of mountains that was the first day of school of business for me and um, every day I'm learning so uh, I think business is something that you do you do learn on the job uh, a lot of the stuff that you do a lot of the stuff that I learned through my formal education is development based and I do accredit that for um, the business model that I have developed now because um, it has a very developmental um, uh, core. I, I wouldn't. That's what drives me every day because I am passionate about um, development in Africa, and so I'm using business as, as a vehicle to um, to achieve those things uh, that we studied in university. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, we just have time for one more question. I see a lady in the back, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that, but really. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Anjuma Sadameen. I'm a Dish Secretary in Ministry of Commerce, Pakistan. And uh, my question is again related to the successes and failures. Um, we know that SMEs, uh, they have a great contribution to support manufacturing and they create employment at the national level. But this is also observed that 20% of the SMEs, they go out of business after one year and 50% of them, they are out in, they fail in, um, I mean, they die in next five years. So only 30% they go in the long term. Uh, and financing is one of the big issue. Liquidity is one of the big issues. For, for my country, uh, Samida, small and medium enterprise uh, development uh, is one uh, agency that government supports to, that government has created to support the small and medium enterprise. But yet, there are successes and failures, and uh, like somebody mentioned, that we would like to hear the, st uh, the, the failure stories also. At least we, we, we should know the facts that 70% of them go out of business in five years. And, and necessary measures and the sensitivities we should be aware of. Uh, any, any, any highlights on that uh, will yeah. be appreciated. Thank you very much. Anybody who would like to comment on that? Great question. Anna? Yeah, Anna first. Okay. Um, one of my favorite books, if, if you like nonfiction, is called The Originals. It's by Adam Grant. He's a professor at Stanford. And uh, in it, it, he talks about um, the fact that he passed on investing in Warby Parker, which is now one of the largest eyeglasses manufacturers in the world. It's a billion dollar company. And he passed on investing in them because the company founders were only working on the company part time. And he thought that that was the worst idea ever. He would never invest in a company where the founders weren't fully committed, and now they're worth a billion dollars. So he decided to go and look into that. What was, was that actually true, that you shouldn't invest in companies where the founders aren't full-time? And he found that 30%, you're 30% more likely to survive that first year if you have a part-time job, because you have more time to validate your idea, get it going, and improve the business model to a point where you can actually pay yourself and pay your team. And so I think there's different ways of thinking around that startup in that first year that we need to evaluate. And some of our rhetoric around why these companies are failing maybe is due to us not doing things differently. Um, so that's something I'd just add to the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, Mama? Yeah, um, I also come from an environment where there's a high failure rate. Um, I think uh, the onus is on the entrepreneur um, a lot of the times we look at government and say government should do more uh, to make sure that entrepreneurs succeed. Well, all the government, we can expect the government to do is to create an, an enabling environment. Um, it's really up to the people who are running the businesses to learn how to manage uh, businesses properly um, to make sure that their cash flow um, can help them survive. Uh, one of the major problems that we had when we first started and we, we still do, uh, most businesses do, is, um, is cash flow. And um, in, the, in third world countries, access to finance is a huge um, problem. But how do you um, manage, how do you bootstrap in those days when you don't have the cash flow? How do you manage, how do you uh, innovate so that you can stay alive, just, uh, just so that you can get over that hump where you don't have the cash flow? Um, those are things that entrepreneurs need to have a look at themselves and see how they can overcome those things. I think we have to take a lot more responsibility. Yeah, take the fate in your own hands. Lorena. And also understanding that failures, sometimes even in Brazil, like uh, the word failure, it's very, uh, if 
it, it has a lot of meaning when sometimes it shouldn't. So the entrepreneur shouldn't like uh, fear that much the failure. But the whole process of like failing fast and being awarded by failing, okay, what I learned from this, when I can start. So I think one understanding failure as the process of becoming a good business because you can't like go right on in the first try. You are going to failure a lot until you do the things right, you know. Uh, but balance this with education. So get the failures from other entrepreneurs that already did and make it clear, make it visible, make it uh, people talk about that. And then you understand that the cash flow thing yeah. or the other things are just part of the process. Yeah, uh, watch more discussions like this. Uh, <laughs> I hope um, the may failure I see, rate may will I see be it very we are, We're answer. almost running out of time. Yes, one sentence, please. If yeah, um, uh, I wanted to say that a theoretical answer on your question that uh, uh, there are uh, about at least three top universities where there are at least deep, uh, three top professors and they have the best, best, best books about what is the management, how to do that, mm. and at least it uh, have to learn that it's important. But that's possible to learn yeah. how to manage. I've never been in the Harvard, in a Stanford and MIT, but I have on myself as all the books what they speak about the yeah. management because we are really on the extremely bottom line we started. Yeah. Yeah, I see your point. So go read the books. If you cannot go to a business school, educate yourself. It's a continuing process. So we really have to uh, leave it there. Many thanks to our panelists. Moma Mastal, CEO of Tropingo Food, The Gambia. Lorana Scapioni, CEO and founder of Believe Brazil. Shando Corti, president of Court Information Management of Hungary. And Anna Gunther, founder of Pledge Me New Zealand. And many thanks to our panelists, to our members of judges for uh, following us and to all the um, audiences who have been watching us on the Facebook. Uh, um, we'll be back right in about uh, 40 minutes so you have about 40 minutes for a lunch break. The lunch will be on the second floor of, uh, of the uh, venue so please, um, um, please make sure to come back at 2 o'clock because I'll be hosting a second session. Thank you very much. Thank you.